Welcome back to our survey on the different causes of post-operative fever. I would recommend that you watch these videos in sequence going from wind to water to, uh, which I haven't put up yet, walking to wound. That's the order in which these tend to show up and so I would go through these in sequence. Um, so these are common, common, common questions on the USMLE. They love to, to test you on post-operative fever. And so you need to be familiar with these, uh, how, when to suspect them, how to work them up, and how to treat them. The treatment can be a little bit different. And so that's one of the things I want to hammer home to you is how we go about uh, treating these things a little bit differently than how we would treat a community-acquired pneumonia or an uncomplicated UTI. It's going to be different in the post-op setting. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And I am going to switch my pencil here to green because it's a little easier to see. All right, let's uh, take a look here. So I'm not going to run through all these, but these are the various causes of post-op fever. Now, I put post-op day one to three, post-op day three to five. Uh, they're not perfect, okay? So don't think that just because we're on post-op day seven that you can't have a UTI or because we're on post-op day five, you can't have pneumonia. You've got to rely on your clinical judgment, your physical exam findings, and typically the vignette is going to make it fairly easy for you. That said, it does help to remember these uh, this kind of sequence here because um, that may be the major hint that they give you on an exam question. But in real life, you've got to rely on your clinical judgment. Don't rule things out just because of the day. So we're going to talk about UTI here. Let's start with a vignette. You're making your morning rounds and visit a morbidly obese 38-year-old woman who's recently had a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass surgery. She's post-op day three. She's got a 10-year history of type 2 diabetes for which she takes metformin. She complains of suprapubic tenderness and pain on urination, which she thinks came on gradually overnight. Vitals are within normal limits except for a uh, mild fever. Surgical incision sites appear clean and well-dressed. Lung sounds are clear to auscultation. Extremities appear normal. The Foley catheter remains placed on day three. This was originally inserted while she was in the OR for her surgery. What is the most likely diagnosis? And you probably already know because it's the topic here. It is a post-op UTI. That's the most likely diagnosis. Our next step is to get a urinalysis and culture. Okay, now uh, the suprapubic tenderness and pain on urination, that is classic UTI. But what, what risk factors does she have? Well, first of all, she's got a Foley catheter in. And as we're going to see, your risk goes up every day you have that Foley catheter in. She's also got type 2 diabetes. That's a risk factor. She's also a woman. That's a risk factor. And I bet if you asked her, you probably will find out that she's had UTIs in the past. And any person, any woman can tell you uh, that... Uh, if you've gotten a UTI in the past, she's probably had, she's probably going to get more. Some women are just predisposed to them, but the Foley catheter being, uh, being placed is uh, probably the biggest risk factor here. So your culprits for a post-op UTI are pretty much the same as uh, what we see just in general with UTIs. So E. coli is the big cause. Now, a UTI is the most frequent healthcare-associated complication, and it is very clearly associated with the prolonged use of a Foley catheter. As a matter of fact, each day you have a Foley catheter in, each sequential day, uh, your risk of a UTI goes up 5%. Now, your risk also goes up with urinary retention, and that is a very common complication of surgery partially due to the anesthetics, partially due to a little bit of muscle stunning or paralysis, especially if you have an abdominal surgery, like a laparoscopic surgery. Um, and so if you've got urinary retention, your risk of a cystitis goes up. We also see that in people who have urinary retention for other reasons. Traditional risk factors for UTI apply, like we said. Symptoms are pretty much the same as an ordinary UTI, but for some reason, they're more likely to get a fever. 
And typically we don't see that with ordinary UTIs. And as a matter of fact, if you have dysuria with a fever, you should probably be thinking of pyelonephritis. Uh, but in these patients, for some reason, they're, at, uh, they're more likely to get a fever just with an ordinary acute cystitis. So keep that in mind. Do not rule out cystitis just because they have a fever if they're post-op. But otherwise, the symptoms are pretty much the same. Now, when a UTI is suspected, the best initial step is urinalysis and culture, just like any ordinary UTI. The culture is probably not going to help you too much, at least in the short term, uh, but uh, you should still order it nevertheless. And so CBC, urinalysis, and culture are good to order. CBC, if they have an elevated white count, that tips us off maybe to a urosepsis or a pyelonephritis. Um, so we want to keep that in mind. Uh, please note that a post-op UTI is a complicated UTI, and so our treatment is a little bit different. Why is it a complicated UTI? Because they're in a healthcare setting. Okay, it's as simple as that. Now, in this patient, it's also complicated because she had an indwelling catheter in. That also is a complicated UTI. Uh, now, our workup here, uh, as we mentioned, you may see elevated white count. You may not. Your analysis, as you know, with UTI, esterase, nitrites, and a little bit of hematuria uh, is typically seen. Urine culture, probably not going to come back right away, but naturally, it's going to be positive. Now, our treatment for a complicated UTI is levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin. Now, there are a lot of different recommendations. There's a lot of disagreement, but these drugs are totally fine to go with for a complicated UTI. So I would pick one of these two fluoroquinolones. That said, if the patient is pregnant, you cannot give them a fluoroquinolone. Remember, there are teratogenic effects of fluoroquinolones bone issues, teeth issues uh, in the, the developing fetus. You know, they don't come out with teeth, but you'll see it a few years down the road. Uh, so if you're dealing with a pregnant patient, I would give phosphomycin. Okay, phosphomycin or nitrofurantoin, but phosphomycin is a good one because you only need to give one dose. Um, so that's good. Levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin, for their part, uh, the reason that I would pick those is because they are oral medications and ultimately these patients are gonna be discharged. You're not gonna keep someone in the hospital just because they have some pain when they're peeing. Uh, you would keep them in the hospital if they had a persistent fever and chills and all that stuff. Uh, but most of these patients aren't going to have that. You start them on antibiotics, they get better. Uh, so you having those oral medications is useful. Uh, now, that being said, uh, there are IV drugs that you can give, but I would imagine on the exam, you're going to be asked um, how to treat them, and levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin would be the right answer. If you're dealing with a pregnant patient, phosphomycin is a great drug to give. Complications, pyelonephritis, look for this. If they start having flank pain under their ribs, um, that is a, a hint of of pyelonephritis, but really it can be difficult to distinguish these two. Ultrasound can sometimes tell you, but most of the time it doesn't. The thing is, with pyelonephritis, we treat it pretty much the same way as a complicated UTI. So, you know, call up the ID doc if you want, but for the most part, on your exam, you're going to treat it the same way. Now, perinephric abscess, on the other hand, you start feeling that mass, the fever doesn't go away when you start antibiotics, get an ultrasound, find the abscess, call surgery, have it drained, continue the antibiotics. Um, just some basic strategies for preventing these complicated UTIs post-op. Make sure and use aseptic technique when you place the catheter. Common sense, but common sense isn't always that common in the hospital. And for the majority of patients, get those catheters out as quickly as you can. Um, you know, yes, urinary retention is a problem. Um, you can do a straight cath if you need to, but tr don't keep the catheter, an indwelling catheter, in longer than you need to because it's not going to help. Like I said, every day you have that catheter in, your risk goes up 5%. So you want to get that thing out of there.